Right. Uh, why don't we get started? Hello. Uh, welcome to week eight of the ASCP and Pathologist Overseas Laboratory Quality Management Systems virtual course. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have Dr. Jeanette Warner back for a lecture on facilities and safety. Uh, as you might remember, uh, Dr. Warner is an expert in infectious disease pathology and global pathology and laboratory medicine, and she serves as medical director of clinical laboratories and uh, vice chair for faculty affairs at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Warner. Thank you so much, um, Emily, for the kind introduction, and I'm happy to be back with everybody um, in, in, for this lecture. So, so the learning objectives are that at the end of the module, people are going to be able to relate how facility design impacts the efficiency and safety of laboratory workers, describe practices to prevent or reduce risk, less personal or protective equipment that should be used routinely by laboratory workers and explain general safety requirements for laboratory and describe the steps to take in response to emergencies such as biological or chemical spills or laboratory fires. So I think everybody has seen this little um, square thing over and over again if you're doing this lecture. So in yellow, you can see that um, one of the component, 12 components of a uh, quality management system it includes facilities and safety. So let's start with the scenario. You are grossing a total colectomy specimen, and while cleaning the specimen, you feel something splashing to your eye. You take off your gloves and go to the sink. And, and you know do whatever you need to do in the sink. And um, you know the question that we always have to think about is what are the elements to consider ensuring biosafety in the situation? And there's going to be obviously um, multiple um, um, things that have to be in place, um, including engineering, um, engineering measures and uh, and all the things that we need to be using while grossing a specimen. And then you also need to think about having a process or a procedure. Once you have somebody with a splash or a cut, how do you go to the next steps? What are the next steps that need to be done? And each, um, um, each, each location, each institution will have different um, different principles, but in general, there's always going to be, okay, you clean the wound or you clean the splash, then you go to the emergency room, or in our case, we go to occupational health. And then from there, uh, all the, the, the process starts, you know, do we need to test specimens or patients? Do we need to test the, the, the person that got splashed? What are the tests that need to be done? And that depends entirely or is, is very, although there may be some principles that need to be followed, it will depend a lot on the, on the facility and what the facility has. So when we are thinking about the hierarchy of safety controls, the, the, the most uh, secure, the best thing that we have are the engineering controls. And this referred to work environment changes that reduce hazard. And in the example of the splash to the eyes, we can think of, you know, you have a biological safety uh, cabinet in such a way that you don't get splashed or you use goggles. So those are things that to, to be thinking, but if you're using goggles, you are basically at the lowest um, hierarchy of safety controls because that's personal protective equipment and somebody can take them off or put them on or decide that they don't have them with them so they, they use them. So the best or the, the, the safety, safetyest of them all would be an engineering uh, control with a safety cabinet. Other controls or following the engineering controls are the administrative controls. And these are modifications 
of the work to reduce exposures. And that's uh, basically to develop and make sure that everybody in the, in the, in the lab is uh, following their chemical hygiene plan. For example, and then work practices, you know, to reduce the exposure to hazardous chemicals or biological hazards, and this could include chemical substitutions or banning uh, mouth pipetting. Now, when you have a specimen, since that's what we do every day, you know, deal with with specimens, whether they are blood or urine or a, or a, a, a mastectomy you know, we cannot substitute that specimen. However, we can do certain things to protect ourselves um, for, for certain um, parts of the process. And as last I said, the, the, in the hierarchy of safety controls, the personal protective equipment is to be provided to the workers so as to keep them safe. However, how they use them or if they use them corrected correctly, you can teach them, you can tell people to do it, but sometimes people just don't do what needs to be done. So here are some ways or things to be thinking about general safety equipment. We have a safety cabinet there at the top. Then if we're thinking about fires, we can have um, um, fire extinguishers or uh, to detect if there's smoke. Uh, smoke detectors, we tend to use from the engineer perspective also showers and eye, eye washers. Um, and then the chemical hygiene plan will include the PPE, but it will include also um, all, the, uh, all the cabinets for flammables, waste disposal. So all these things that are important in, in, that we have in our labs. So the way I'm going to uh, go through my presentation is we're going to do the description and how to protect the workers first for physical hazards, then we'll go to chemical hazards, the last biological hazards, and then we're talking, we're, we'll be talking about laboratory design and what are the things that we have to think about when we're designing a lab or when we are redesigning the routines so that we can um, make them uh, flow in a better and uh, safest way. So let's talk about physical hazards. And as you probably know by now, I like uh, stamps. And here you have stamps that talk about electricity falling from a, from a ladder or um, a pipette. So, um, when we there's a, an inquiry that was done between 93 and 97 so it's a little old however it's still a lot of the, of the things that are here are still um the usual um and in research labs it, it's interesting the most frequent um the most frequent problem that causes injuries to employees is laceration. I guess they're not as careful with some of the stuff that, that we could be using like scalpels and needles and that sort of things, followed by bruises, sprains and, and uh, strains and fractures, and then the chemical exposures and, um, and eye injuries. So the first question I have for you, and this is a polling question, is which is the most frequent hazard in the laboratory? And this would be a clinical laboratory, not a research laboratory. How are we doing, Ken? Uh, we are have some votes trickling in. Um, actually, pretty quickly today, uh, we're up to seventy five percent. So let, let me uh, show you the results. Okay, cool. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Actually, the 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 most um, frequent is bruise sprains and strains. Okay, and when we talk about clinical laboratory the most frequent um, issue that we see in the lab, as you can see by more than half, is the bruises, sprains, uh, strains, and fractures. 
Um, and I would say even repetitive stress will be joined in that same um, in that same environment. And I think it's because we've done a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the lab uh, very safe. So that's why lacerations and chemical exposures are not at the very top. But it is the stress of repetitive pipetting or sitting incorrectly in the lab and doing the same maneuver over and over that causes the most strain or the most uh, injuries in the lab. Um, I got, yes, I got several, um, um, the following three slides that I have, I got them out from a page that I saw in, in the Harvard um, laboratories, which I thought was really, really good. So they're basically taking what's happening in the lab. So like, for example, manual pipetting and how it's, uh, it, it, it can strain on your, on your thumb is a very important um, thing that people can have. And actually, after doing some research for a year, I ended up with a Decker vein uh, injury myself because I was doing so much manual pipetting. So using some of the more automated pipettes is, is, a, is a lot better. Now, sitting in a chair, I think a lot of people, um, especially those of us that use microscopes, um, we can sit uh, incorrectly at the microscope. So ergonomically designed chairs with uh, adjustable uh, back support, um, and if you need to make your chair up or down, so so as to be able to be at the right um, at the right place in your in 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 your height for your height in in that area in microscopy, okay. Obviously, having your shoulders and your neck uh, relaxed while you're looking at the scope, and I think uh, the new microscopes are great because you can adjust the the. Ocular. So it's really a, a, a good thing so that you can have that um, next state. Then um, you want to limit the time at certain um, in certain positions that are not really great. Like, for example, when you're cutting uh, frozen sections in a cryostat, that position is not a real good anatomic position. However, um, if you do, you know, a few frozen sections or one frozen section, then, you know, take a, a lap and then do another, it's better because you're limiting the time that you are in an upward position. And then like items in your laboratory have to be within reach so that you don't fall from a chair or put a chair back and, and, and create some issue. Or um, you also want to have your arms um, parallel to the floor. Your your um, your arms need to be parallel to the floor while doing a lot of this, um, you know, microscope or 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 you know, pipetting or cryostat. And then in flow cytometry, again, the neck flexion can 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 cause a lot of strain and can cause problems for the people that are doing this uh, constantly. And then um, make sure that the materials that you need for your work are within reach and you don't have to be pulling in one direction, getting up and down and the chair moving back and forth and um, and and you not being and, and or having to step up on a step uh, that's usually not very good. And it's, it's always very important to have support on your feet. So I think I, when I was uh, preparing the lecture and I started looking at the different things that um, were um, interesting and fun from the visual perspective, I thought that this, um, this um, um, uh, little things that they have for Harvard that were very, very useful. So um, needles, broken glass, and sharps, we have to put them in the, in the, re, in the, the, the containers that are uh, hard. You always want to have this uh, puncture-resistant, leak-proof uh, sharp containers. Um, and then um, you're, um, you don't want to have any broken glass in, in containers that are, are flexible and somebody can, can, um, 
can puncture their hand by doing that. And that's the um, thing that you see that um, big cross over that particular person trying to grab a needle that is um, basically sticking out. And when you're picking up um, a spill, like the one that you see in the middle bottom um, picture, you see that the person is wearing, gla wearing gloves and also using a, a, a two pieces of paper, two pieces of cardboard to pick the, the shards from that tube that broke. So you don't want to pick by hand this, this um, pieces of, uh, of glass because you can um, then cut yourself too. So it's very important to think about this, um, these things. I don't think nowadays we see very many needles in the, in, in the lab. Um, and we're not recapping needles except for maybe phlebotomists do, go out, but they are instructed not to recap and to throw the needles directly into the, the puncture resistant uh, containers. So I think that's uh, an important improvement. That's one of the frequent things that happen. If you recap needles, you can get um, punctured and that's, uh, that's, that should be avoided as much as um, possible. So I'm, I'm going to go next to chemical hazards. I don't know if there's any questions about the, the, the physical hazards. Oh, hi, Jeanette. Um, no questions so far about physical hazards. Um, do you do have a gray, like something uh, is gray and boxed out at the top of your PowerPoint? Is there, a, do you have another window open? No, I don't have any window open, but I, for some reason, the, the little bar is, is up and I don't know how to get it out. Oh, okay. Okay, great. I was mm -hmm. just hoping if there was something. Yeah, else. no, I, I know that bar sometimes appears and it just doesn't go away. And I don't understand how, I don't know how to push it up. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I'm trying, but as you can see, I'm having uh, issues. Okay. Uh, no problem. I All will right. keep on going. Hopefully, I don't know if he'll disappear. <laughs> Okay, chemical hazards. So I, I chose a few um, stamps that have to do with uh, chemistry. I think one of the um, uh, ones that I like a lot and I tend to put a lot both for education and for chemistry is the one of the state of Hawaii because it has the, the test tube there. So I think it's, uh, it's absolutely fantastic that a, a country has decided to put a, um, a, a chemical or chemistry uh, test tube for their education day. So I think that I love that. So uh, material data, uh, safety data sheets. I think um, everybody knows about them. Every, um, every producer or everybody that buys from whatever vendor does have, uh, when they send you the material, they send you this, uh, the MSDS uh, sheets. And I think everybody um, has used them um, and it depends, uh, you know, they tell you if it's uh, a, a flammable substance, it, if it, uh, if you require protective equipment to use it, if it's uh, important for you to make sure that you are not in contact with it very long because it can have health hazards or if it can react with certain other um, components, whether it's an acid or a base or, or higher temperatures. And we have um, our uh, flammable cabinets. Now, we've been using this for a long, long time. And in the United States, um, since uh, 1971, we have been in, in, we have to be in compliance with, with OSHA, which is the, the uh, occupational um, um, agency that goes over all the materials that we use in labs and we use in, in many other um, industries. So it's not really only for laboratories or hospitals. It also includes uh, work in, in the factory that produces Coke and Pepsi, it, 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 it's, it's all over the place. And they look at the work safety, they look at work hazards, they look at um, work environment, the, the protection of employees and the safety procedures. They're, they're our regulatory agency in the United States. So um, the question I have here is because I think 
one of the things that has happened is in the, so every country had their own little thing and, or and maybe some countries didn't have even anything, but um, some countries had their thing, like we had OSHA. So when were, when and where was the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of, uh, of chemicals started? So you have um, some time to think about this. How are we doing, Ken? A, a little more slowly this time. <laughs> it's a tougher question. <laughs> need, need to learn history of, uh, of, um, of the GHS. Okay, but okay, we're, we're at about we're at about fifty percent, and it's okay, down. Okay, let's see to, what people say. To, it's down to two. Okay, it was good. It's Brazil, nineteen ninety two. Actually, that's when um, the UN decided that we needed to do something to standardize um, the what all the chemicals that are, were being shipped back and forth between different countries and that we needed to have some sort of a harmonized system of classifying all these chemicals. It's interesting, um, the other um, landmarks that I put here are interesting because even though the first thought of doing this occurred in um, Brazil at that meeting, it's interesting that people did not start doing the harmonized system till much later. And actually, it's China was one of the first countries to do it in, in 2011. Mexico, which is where I'm from, didn't do it till 2015. And in the US, interestingly enough, we didn't even start thinking about this until 2017. So I find it uh, really fascinating to see how um, different places have done it um, at different um, times. So it began, as I said, in 1992 in the Rio de Janeiro Conference on Environment and Development that was uh, called by the United Nations. And it was uh, a, a part of the Earth Summit. Um, and there were international labor organizations, organizations for economic cooperation and development, and various government and other stakeholders that agreed to have a globally harmonized hazard classification and compatible labeling system, including material safety data sheets and easily understandable symbols that you um, that you that you could use. And they didn't come up with the symbols and all that stuff till 2000. So, um, but, the, but the first, um, the whole thing started in 1992 in, in this meeting in Brazil. So the GHS, um, so was, you know, it started and they agreed to do it by 2000. And then the first um, labeling of chemicals came up or they started working on it on 2003. And uh, it includes criteria for health, for physical and environmental hazards, as well as specifying information that should be included on labels of hazardous chemicals, as well as safety data sheets. So it, it includes, it's, it's a bit all inclusive. So what are the elements that are present or should be present in safety data sheets? Well, you need to have an identification of the chemical identification of the hazards, composition and in, in information about the ingredients that are in that chemical um, thing or that chemical uh, substance that they're sending you. They need to tell you what are the first aid measures and if there needs to be any firefighting measures, um, accidental release measures, and how you have to handle it and storage it exposure and control of, uh, of the use of, of personal protection, physical and chemical properties of the chemical, 
And then toxicological information, ecological information. Okay, remember that this was in in the Earth um, in the Earth Summit. So ecological information was already being taken into consideration and should be taken into consideration. How we dispose of the chemical, how we transfer transport the information from not only from one country to another, but also from one um, place to another in your same hospital and regulatory information. And if there's any other information that needs to be present. So that's the, those are all the elements that should be in your SDS. So your next question that we have here is, could you see a symbol like that? Okay, obviously there's two hands that are washing. What does it mean? So this is a polling question. How are we doing? Uh, we just hit 50%. Okay. So let's share the results. Okay, it's a mandatory action. Excellent. So that is because the color is blue. Okay, so it's a mandatory action. So anything that's a red circle with a diagonal, it's a prohibition. And you see several uh, prohibition things there. You don't enter that, that person should not be entering. There's some gloves or something that should not be happening. Then anything that is a triangle and is yellow is, is gonna be a hazard. And then um, anything that is a red, I'm sorry, anything that is blue or in a blue little um, bubble, it's a mandatory action. So a mandatory action of using goggles or, or sound protection. So the other thing that we've been doing um, as of late, at least in the United States, but I know that some countries in the world have been doing for uh, longer, are the pictograms that apply to the laboratory. So we are not using, we still use the, the that little um, square that has the, the blue, the red, the yellow, and the white. However, we need to also use in the United States or OSHA is asking us to also use this little symbol. So the symbol of that thing that looks like a bomb that's expl exploding is an explosive. If it's, it has, has like that fire, it's a fire hazard. If it has that round and then like fire, that's an oxidizer and that may cause fire. Then if you have those two uh, test tubes, um, that are, you know, and then there's a hand and there, there's a bar that looks like it's being corroded. It's corrosive metal that may cause uh, skin burns. And then if you see that, um, that cylinder, I think everybody by now knows that that's uh, compressed gas and it may explode. Then and obviously, if you have a skull with the bones, it's fatal if inhaled, swallowed, or if it's in contact with skin. Then if you see an exclamation point, it causes serious eye or skin irritation. It could be harmful. It could be a narcotic. Then if you see the shot, a silhouette of a person with that little um, the six point star means that it may cause cancer, fertility issues, or organ damage. And the last one I think is, uh, is, is, is interesting, but it's part of this environmental um, earth uh, summit um, part is the that tree that has no leaves and the fish that is uh, upside down. That basically is telling you that it's hazardous to, hazardous to aquatic life or the environment. So let's talk a little bit about chemical spills. Chemical spills need to be contained and you can define them as major and minor spills. Major, major spills may require her uh, help from the outside of the laboratory to be contained. 
And so a minor skill, skill, uh, spill could be something that a, a bottle in your lab, a small bottle breaks and, and you have uh, a spill in, in, in the floor of that, um, of that bottle of whatever it contained. And a major spill could be like what happened to us the other day. It was, it was not uh, fun. So we have a, um, not all the, all the um, anatomic path. Or so, so in the hospital where I am, um, the Midtown Hospital, we gross the specimens uh, for pathology. And then we send the cassettes, obviously in formal, and we send them to the central lab where this, in the central lab, they will get paraffin embedded and, and then the slides will be done. And then the slides are returned back to, to the Midtown Hospital. So the person that was carrying all the cassettes in the formalin, um, for some reason or another, the strap of the container that she was um, carrying broke and it spilled all this formalin in front of an elevator where there were tons of people coming in, up and down. And it was, a, a, you know, she panicked. And instead of calling immediately on her cell phone saying, I have a spill, I need somebody to come help me, she decided to run to the lab and, and, and then get somebody to help. But she, she left the spill in front of the elevator where there are people coming on, in and out, um, not secured. So I think that's, uh, to me, that was an, a very important um, teaching mon moment, not only, not only for, for our courier person that was uh, transporting the specimens, but it, it was a, a, an important moment for everybody that was there because we needed to contain what that major spill was because it was it was as larger than the spill that you see there with that man um, in, in his suit. So what to do when you have a spill? Well, you have to have a spill kit, okay? And, uh, and obviously you have to make sure that um, you have the, the, the little, those rods that are the, the gray rods that are hanging from the, from the yellow bucket. Those are to contain, to surround the, the, the spill. Then you have to have your goggles, your gloves, you have to have your absorbent uh, material and you have those spill absorbent pillows and then you have your absorbent towels. And then you have to have the yellow uh, bags and the uh, yellow container. It could be any other color where once you're, you pick up all the absorbed material, you can put it on the, on the, on the bags and inside the, the, the container. So you need to have that spill kit available so that if formalin or anything like that could, could, could spill, you can then, um, you can then uh, pick it up. And the first thing that a person needs to do is to assess how big the spill is. Then you have to alert others and secure the area. And I think that's the, the big thing. Um, you alert others. You can alert others by staying there and telling people, please be careful. There's a spill here. And with your cell phone, or you can ask anybody that is coming around, can you call um, such and such in your phone or whatever so that they can bring and help you um, help you with the spill, you have to identify the hazard. So in the case of the formalin container, well, obviously it was formalin and she knew what she was carrying. However, it, sometimes you may not know because it's a bottle that is there, has been there forever. And then when you pull something else down, that bottle came down. So you need to sometimes, oh, what was that bottle that, that fell? You need to find out what the hazard war was, you have to prepare to control the, the spill and contain and absorb. You, um, you are supposed to collect and clean. And obviously you have to dispose of the material that, that you, you know, the formalin that was spilled or the dye that was uh, there, you have to be able to dispose of it correctly. And that's where the SES are so important because then you can say, okay, this is this way we need to dispose. And then you need to, we always have something that we communicate the incident to the, to the different levels of our hierarchy 
so that, um, you know, if there's education that needs to be done or if the spill kits are not complete or whatever needs to be done to make sure that we can, we are able to, um, to, to contain the, the spill, we can do it. So communicating the incident it's not only um, alerting others, but communicating up to let them know um, what happened and if were there any problems with whatever you were doing um, and how to make it better or correct it next time that, it, um, that you have a spill. Okay, so five elements when there's an, a, a, an exposure is hazard identification, Determine the hazardous chemical that the worker will encounter, have information in your MSDS, um, have a chemical hygiene plan that has a standard operating procedure on how to handle the hazardous chemical in the lab, information and training uh, for employees and employers, um, exposure monitoring, uh, especially if you're doing anything that you may think that it's higher exposure to what you should. Like, for example, if you're receiving radioactive material, I think nowadays in the labs, we don't do that anymore, but there may be some locations where radioactivity is still being used. And so you may need to have a counter to define how much exposure is there um, for the employees. And usually they give you a little um, batch that you use for a week or so to see how much, uh, how much um, radiation there, there has been or the person has been exposed. That can also be done with, uh, with formalin. There are some formalin, formalin detectors to define whether people are being uh, exposed um, uh, to much more formalin than they should. And then there should be medical consultation for anybody that has been exposed. So for example, on that, uh, on the, uh, on the um, incident that I talked about, about the formalin spilling, um, the, the, the lady that was the carrier of the, of the material of the samples, she was, uh, we, we did go and ask her to go to the physician and, and to our occupational hazard, uh, our occupational, um, clinic. And, and she, you know, we went, she went through the entire, um, uh, cons medical consultation as she had been exposed. So let's talk a little bit about laboratory fire safety. So we use in the United States two um, acronyms. We use RACE and we use PAST. So RACE is rescue, alarm, confine, and extinguish. And PAST is for the extinguisher, where you pull the pin, aim at the base of the fire, squeeze the handle, and sweep side to side to contain that fire. So in, in, in here, you have the, the entire um, thing that we um, I'll talk about. So um, one of the things that we do on a regular basis is we have drills, fire drills. And we basically, um, the first thing we do is, well, is there anybody that has been injured by a fire? So we try to rescue whoever was injured by a fire. We know how to pull our alarm for the fire, um, you know, for, for our fires. We try to confine so the doors in the lab need to be shut. And then if we are able to extinguish the fire with the fire extinguisher, know how to use the fire extinguisher. However, if the fire is, is very big, then you may only, you may have to wait for the firemen to arrive. So I have another question, polling question. Which of the following uh, statements is true? Okay, where are we? We just hit 50%. So here are the results. 
Okay, actually, it's the 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 deep all uh, fires except the deep fat fire fires fires can be extinguished by dry chemicals. Okay, so that's the that's the correct um, answer. Okay, so here are the types of extinguishers that that you can have. They're divided into class A, B, C, and D and F or K. And uh, and you can see which ones are used um, for what for the different things that um, that you can have um, fires that you can have. Um, I think the type A, um, which is the fires that involve um, wood, paper, textile, etc., is um, is the one that is used very frequently because it use it basically can do all the all the different um, all the different types of um, of uh, fires that you can have either powder or foam you know the, the types of, of chemicals that are in the in the in the in the in in the extinguisher um, per se okay so that's probably the one that is the most um, the most um, useful. So any questions about um, about our chemical fires? Okay, have... Chemical fires, chemical, uh, <laughs> chemical hazards, I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, so we did have one question specific to chemical hazards. Um, so are there any guidelines uh, about the distance between a core laboratory and a laboratory that uses uh, hazardous chemicals? Um, the example they gave was an anatomic pathology laboratory. Well, I think both um, use uh, chemicals that can be hazard hazardous. And as far as I know, we don't have guidelines of separation, how far away one from the other need to be. Um, but I, I, I guess we can look it up, but I don't think there's anything in particular. As long as you have the things in the uh, in the bio uh, the, in the hoods, and as long as and in the cabinets, as long as they are not people are not exposed from one to the other, I think they'll be okay. And that's where I think the using those badges that you can that you can see how how much you've been exposed. I think that's that's a good way to look at them. But I've seen labs that are back to back, meaning uh, the, the 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 anatomic pathology and the um, core laboratory are literally back to back, and there's really no no problem, even though there's a wall in between them. All right, great, thank you. Okay. Um, another question that just came in was, can you, uh, or maybe this is something. Um, you could share with us after your lecture, a protocol or procedure for conducting a fire drill. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can do that. I, I, we, I don't know if we, that, I need to look, look for one because the lab, we, we have a whole procedure on how to deal with the fire, not necessarily on how to do a fire drill, but I can ask my, my safety people to see if we have a specific procedure on how to do a conducted drill. Um, it's interesting for us, the, the conducting the fire drills is usually done by the fire marshal. So at least in, in, in my lab, the way that they usually come is we hear a, um, a page from the operator and they say fire drill in X place. And then if you know it's the lab, then basically, we we go out of the exit that we're supposed to go out and then the fire marshal is there waiting for us and then the fire marshal has already gotten a, a a fire extinguisher in the hand and then the first thing they do is they they make sure that we are all there okay so they basically um take a list of all the people that have been in the lab and make sure that there's nobody left in the lab Okay, and then they um, 
And then they ask you to do, to tell, you know, to do the pass, you know, to pull the pin and, and do the entire, uh, the entire thing. We don't, we don't squeeze to aim at a fire because we don't have a fire at the time, but you, you are supposed to, you know, go through the motions of the, of the, of the fire extinguisher and they give you the fire extinguisher so that you, it's an empty one, but you're pulling, you're aiming, you're, you're squeezing and you're doing the movement of the past, say that the fire is right there. So they, it's usually conducted by our fire master, but I can ask them to see if we can, if we have a, a whole procedure on that. Okay, great question. Great. So we're going to talk about biological hazards, and I think the, you know, if you think about it, the biggest one that we think about is hepatitis, and that um, that um, stamp from India is about uh, hepatitis. But you can think about Ebola, and that's what the uh, stamp on our um, Republic of Niger is all about. Okay, so. Here we have a little cartoon and we want to name what is wrong. So obviously there's many things that are wrong um, here. You have somebody that's using earplugs and listening to their music um, it, while in the lab, which I don't think it's the right thing to do at all because then they cannot hear an announcement or what's going on. You have a, um, a paper that is peeling off from the surface and could basically catch fire or catch um, um, microbes. You have chemicals that have spilled um, in that beaker that has that, um, that blue uh, material, blue-green material. Then you have this, this man, is, his, um, his, um, his lab coat, coat is opened. He's not wearing gloves. He's not wearing um, goggles. And nowadays he's not wearing a, um, a, 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 a mouth cover. And then he has a letter. I, we assume it's a personal letter or some sort of thing that is that is contaminated with the material that's from that centrifuge. So, you know, and he's handling it without gloves. And then his goggles are bare instead of being in his eyes. And then there's a petri dish that is open. And the girl and the girl that's there, I think she's like looking at him and she at least has is, is working in a hood and has a, a pipette, but the pipette is outside. She also has her gloves, so she's doing a lot better job than, um, than he is. But the next thing that we also see in the bench that he's working on is he has a cup. And we are not supposed to have cops in, in, in the lab. So there's a lot of things that are wrong in this uh, environment. Um, other things that I'm looking at right now is there's a cabinet that's opened and that shouldn't be happening. Um, but there is um, uh, co controls, you know, you see a sink with soap, which is good. And, and you, this girl is working in the safety hood. There, there are the goggles, but they're not being worn, but she doesn't need them though. Um, and she's wearing her lab coat and her, her gloves, which is um, good. So, and this is one of my texts, her name is Matilda. And she's successioning specimens. And you can see what we're wearing, what are the, the protections that she's wearing, uh, ocular prote protection, in, inhalation protection, ingestion pro protection, skin protection, and the lab coat. And you can see also the, the containers in the back for the, any, any material that could broken. So you can see how she is using all the adequate um, personal protective equipment as she is accessioning our specimens. So the next um, polling question that I have is which organism is the one that poses the highest risk of laboratory acquired infections? How are we doing, Ken? Um, 
Answers are coming in a little bit more slowly this time. Let's give this a few more seconds. Okay. Okay, we're at about two thirds. So okay. Here so, are the results. Ooh, no. Everybody worries about HIV, but actually the correct um, answer is brucella. Out of all the organisms that are there, the one that poses the highest risk is brucella. Uh, HIV, Neisseria, and Coxy are all possible to, uh, to acquire through doing the wrong things in the lab. And I've seen people actually die of Neisseria meningitides um, after being exposed in the laboratory. And obviously there's the HIV um, uh, stories too. But the one organism that poses the highest risk of laboratory acquired infections is brucella. So this is an old study and I'm gonna do several things, several things to show you why brucella is so, um, such an important uh, pathogen. So uh, there were problems or there was a centrifugation that was not done correctly on a specimen that had brucella. And, and the actually the people that got infected were 94. And it went people that were from the basement to the third floor. Coccidioides, which is a very, um, um, I would say American, American continent, uh, infection, because I don't think that there's coccidioides in, in, in Africa. Coccidioides, is, it, 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 it's very infectious um, and it can cause death in people that are pregnant and are handling these materials. Um, this was a transfer of solid media um, and two building floors. So, so it's only two buildings versus uh, four buildings, uh, four floors in the brucellosis and was 13 people. Coxsackie virus, it's a spill tube and was made basically 15 feet and it's two people. Murine typhus, which was uh, intranasal inoculation of mice and the people were separated about six um, feet apart and it was six people infected. Tularemia uh, with petri dishes uh, plates um, that were dropped. Um, it was a distance of 70 feet. Okay, so it's almost uh, like a basement and it's um, five people infected. And then Venezuelan encephalitis, which was uh, lyophilized ampules that contained the virus. And it was uh, basically three floors and it's a pretty good number. So it's, uh, it's um, following brucellosis um, in, in infectiousness and, and amount of, of floors involved, but you can see brucellosis is, is really at the top in this study from uh, 1956. Now, this is a one that was um, published in uh, 2009 um, in clinical infectious diseases. And um, they looked at two data points. The first uh, table is from um, 76 to 78. And you can see that uh, brucellosis, again, tops it with basically a lot of cases, a, a lot of deaths. And um, it's higher, almost double the amount than Q fever, hepatitis, typhoid fever, tularemia, tuberculosis. And you can say, OK, at that point in time, we didn't know much about HIV and whatever. But what about 2002, 2004? And here, HIV doesn't even here, there, okay. Shihela came up at the very top with numbers of infections, but the relative risk was only one in this particular um, um, table that they put. Brucella, they had seven infections, but the odds ratio, the, the relative risk, was eight thousand <laughs> times. So as you can see, um, brucella is really at the top. 
interestingly enough, and we talked a little, I commented a little bit about Neisserium and Ingidides. Here, the relative risk is, is, is high, but not as high as, uh, as, the, as, as Brucella. So in, in other words, sometimes we don't see, or, or we think that the risk is higher for certain things, like people were thinking about HIV, when the, when the risk may be higher for maybe even hepatitis C than it is for HIV and out of all the all the all the um uh, but bacteria brucella seems to top it off at the at the very very top and whenever we have a culture in our lab of brucella we're extremely careful we tape it we uh, work on the on the specimen on hoods, we are very, very careful because we know that we put uh, we we are putting people um, at risk. So the biological hazards can be either aerosols, droplets, which are the main source of contamination. Obviously, um, injections or lacerations are also up there, but we have enough controls there that probably the biggest way that they um, produce. Uh, problems as are as aerosols or, or droplets. And I think, you know, now that we're in COVID and we're using masks all the time, I the same way that um, when HIV came along and we started paying a lot of attention and using gloves and using containers to put the sharps and it started using universal precautions and you know no math pipetting, no none of those uh, things that we used to do when I was a, a, a young resident, people would come into the lab with cups and you're like, okay, um, you know, that sort of thing. People smoked in labs at that time, but we didn't know that much about HIV. And now that we've instituted and HIV has made us be very careful about universal precautions, I hope in some way or another that COVID um, makes us very conscious about um, wearing masks in, 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 in hospitals and labs. I know people may not um, like masks very much. However, I think that um, because at, at this point, our, uh, our biggest uh, biological hazard are aerosols and droplets, I think you need to consider this as a big changing event. All, um, you know, all, um, health and laboratories need to be designed in as a biosafety level two or above. And so what does BSL-2 mean? This is another polling question. How are we doing, Ken? So we're at about 40%. Ooh. And up to 50 now. There's a there's a clear favorite answer. So I'll go okay. ahead and Okay, let's share go that. for it. Okay, excellent. That's exactly right. So that's what we what VSL2 mean. So these are the, the first two levels, and we'll, the next slide will be the next two levels. So BSL1 is work with well-characterized agents who do not cause disease in healthy humans. Personal protective equipment is only required for circumstances where the personnel might be exposed to the hazardous material. They must have a door. Now, the BSL2 is the BSL1 plus training in handling pathogenic agents. Access to the lab is limited. If infectious aerosols or crashes may be uh, created, safety cabinets or other physical containment may be used. So I think if we're uh, working in any lab, we're all having a safety cabinet for, especially if we're handling any of our respiratory um, um, uh, secretion. So the personal protective equipment is part of BSL-2. So you need to think about the lab coat, the gloves, the gobbles or gases, or the face shield, clothing that covers legs, and closed toe shoes. No sandals allowed in the lab. 
then the BSL-3 is work with a micro which cause serious and potential lethal disease via inhalation route. And then you have to have a safety cabinet. Personnel are provided medical surveillance and offer uh, relevant immunizations. They must wear um, solid uh, front protective covering. And then the BSL-4 is the highest level of biosafety precautions where it should be done in a biosafety three cabinets and personnel must pass um, through a chemical shower for the contamination. So here they are again. And um, I put also not only the, the description about containment and um, uh, transmission of aerosols, that sort of thing, but also uh, examples of organisms. So in BSL-1, you can work with E. coli. In BSL-2 is basically HIV, um, Borrelia for Lyme, influenza. BSL-3 is the typical tuberculosis um, laboratory, and BSL-4 would be the um, Ebola, anthrax, now the pathogen type, um, you can see that you know what we talked about. The BSL one is minimal potential hazard. The BSL two is moderate hazard. The three is indigenous or exotic agents, and then the BSL four is the dangerous and exotic agents with high risk of aerosolization. And then the practices are are in 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 accordance to whatever you're handling. Okay, so the BSL-2 is open bench, the BSL-3 is control access, directional air, airflow, and biosafety cabinets, and the BSL-4 is the airlock entry, shower exit, special waste disposal, having the um, biosafety cabinets type 3, and um, if you can, uh, double the autoclave for dispose and, of, the, of the material. So appalling question. So um, how should we design the laboratories and, and for which flow, um, the, the flow of what is what design, but decides how we design a laboratory. So it can be the flow of patients, sample or waste, doctor technologists or samples, technology samples or waste, or patient nurses or technologists. So what, what, it, what are the flows that we need to take into consideration? How are we doing, Ken? Let's give this one a little bit more time. Okay. Okay, we're at about two thirds respondents. So okay. Perfect. So it is the patient sample and waste, uh, the thing that makes us. Um, how, how do we design the, the, the lab? And here you have a little um, schematic of a, a lab. It's, a, you know, it's not my lab, it's another whatever number of lab. And the patients are the little feed. And you need to think about what are the areas that the, that the, the these patients are touching. Obviously, you know, where you collect the samples, where they go to the, to the restroom, how they enter and how they get out. And what are the areas where you are, are not allowing the people to go? Now, the sample, how does the sample move from one area to the other? Obviously, the sample will go from the areas where you uh, drew the, the, the specimen. Now it goes into the lab, whether it's a microbiology lab, chemistry, or pathology lab. And, and obviously, most of us uh, start in a processing area. And then the waste, you don't want the waste, you want the waste to have a, an exit. And in this particular um, um, instance, the waste is in the different, uh, in the different, uh, uh, in the different um, laboratories needs to be walked to the exit. 
Um, and hopefully it's not the same exit and entry for the patient, um, per, for the patient, but, but it's outside that um, area. So when you're um, designing a laboratory, you want to follow the patient and sample and waste. You want to have reception and registration um, area for the patient, sampling rooms. You want to um, have uh, know how the sample is going to flow from one lab to the next and how you're going to analyze the samples because that's going to tell you the type of the, the instrument, instruments that you have and your waste disposal. And then you're going to um, do the workflow analysis of the different laboratories and how also you are going to deliver the reports or, and how you're going to file your different results. So during service, uh, you need to have your door closed your or the lab uh, door closed and just entry for the people that are authorized. Okay, and then in the premises, you want to have a ceiling with good ventilation, um, walls and ceilings that are washable or the ceilings, our ceilings are not washable, but we have the ceilings that are panels and you can basically, if there's a splash or there's a problem with any of the areas in the ceiling, we can basically take that panel out and, and replace it with a new uh, panel. So we don't use washable ceilings, even though that's what the, the, the WHO says. We use panel ceiling that we can, we can exchange. And we want to have um, surfaces that are easy to clean and disinfect. And the floor needs to also be easy to clean and disinfect. So in the bench tops, and actually this is interesting because we recently had a, an inspection of um, one of our labs and uh, they had moved an instrument from one location to another and the bench top where they put it was a bench, bench top that was porous. And we got cited for, for having an instrument that we were using in a porous surface. So it's it really important and you know, inspectors pay attention to, this, to those things. And I'm telling you a story because I think it's an important story and an important learning uh, 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 event for us. You don't move anything to a, a surface that is porous. So you want your, your bench tops to be non-porous, easy to clean, resistant to chemicals and, disinfe and, and disinfectants. You don't want anything that's wood or steel. And here you see a lab that has a, a, actually a, 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 an atomic pathology lab. You can see the processor there in the back, the paraffin and battery in the lab. And you can see the nice surface that you have there. Um, there's no ridges, there's no grooves, and it's easily cleanable. And then there's another um, lab here where you can see that they put tiles and obviously the grout in between the tiles is not as cleanable as you may think. So uh, are there any questions about um, biohazards? Yeah, we had a few questions actually. Um, so there were a few that came in that were related to the data you presented on brucellosis. Okay. Um, so, and, and mainly like whether that data was generalizable to Sub-Saharan Africa, because in their experience, um, they've prioritized HIV, TB and hepatitis B and C over brucellosis. So is there any sort of regional data to show this, this risk? Um, so I think, I think it all depends. Um, so uh, that's, that's a great question. And I don't think it's a regional data because brucellosis is brucellosis is brucellosis. So I think the issue here is what, it, what are you culturing? If you're culturing tuberculosis, then you have to go to a BSL-3, to, to BSL okay? Which would be the same that you would use for brucella, okay? So I think once you concentrate an organism such as brucella, it can, it, because we don't think of it as being that infectious, people tend not to do the BSL-3 and they should be doing a BSL-3. So I think that, that uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think that, um, yes, I agree. A lot of people have been paying a lot of attention to HIV, hepatitis, and TB because they are very frequent. We don't know that much the frequency of brucella, but we know it's probably higher than we think it's gonna be. 
And if you're culturing Rusawa, you have to be you have to be cognizant that the possibility of infection is really really high. I don't know if that answered. Great. The yeah. Question. Yeah, I think that uh, if if that didn't answer the question, I would encourage the participants to to answer or type in another question. Um, but uh, there was one also. So the other bios uh, biohazard related one was um, talking about sample collection. So when sample collection is done by um, non uh, non laboratory staff, uh, what is the laboratory's responsibility in monitoring the safety uh, measures at those phlebotomy sites? Well, um, that's a great discussion. I love that discussion because we just had a discussion about that exact same topic in the meeting I was <laughs> in this morning. Um, so we're moving into a new um, laboratory information system and a, a, a hospital information system. And as part of that preparation, we one of the things that we were talking about was who do phlebotomists belong to if they work in certain areas? And it's really interesting because like phlebotomy in the ED, we our, our system, Emory, has um, a total of eight hospitals. There's a, 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 the larger hospital with 600 beds, then the hospital I work at, which is uh, 500 beds, and then there's a bunch of smaller hospitals. But it, what I think is, is interesting is that some of the smaller hospitals have phlebotomists embedded in the ED, and the ED is the one that actually manages the phlebotomies. It's not part of the laboratory personnel. While in, in my hospital and, the, and the, the two biggest hospitals, the phlebotomies that are in the ED are managed by the laboratory. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer to that question is. I'm giving you what we are experiencing here in, in, at Emory. And I don't know if, um, if, 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 there's, if there's a good or a bad. I think the most important thing is that people need to be trained, okay? So it doesn't matter who they belong to, if they belong to the lab or if they belong to, to, the, elect, to, the, to the emergency room or to the floors or to whoever they belong to as personnel. The most important thing is that they need to be trained and they're in many ways the face of the lab because they are, um, they're obtaining the specimens that we will then use. So it's very important to make sure that they know the, the order of the draw. They, if they're going to collect blood cultures, they know how to um, clean the area. If they are, um, if they, if they, they know that they have to fill out the tubes completely. So I think the most important thing is not if there's personnel that uh, belongs to nursing or if there's personnel that belongs to the lab. To me, the most important thing is that they are trained correctly and they are obtaining the specimen correctly. And as far as the protection, we basically give our phlebotomies the same protection that a nurse would receive if they're gonna be touching a patient. And since they're gonna be touching a patient, they receive you know, the entire PPE. Hope that answered the question. Great. Um, and we have a couple more related, but then we also have some general questions. Would you like to keep going or do you want me to? Um, well, why don't we do it right now? And then okay. we, the, that next, um, it's very few slides that I have on, lab, on safety management. Okay, perfect. All right. So uh, one was uh, regarding the question you had about laboratory, uh, the flow of the laboratory. Mm -hmm. So he, this is more of a comment. So they just said that um, in their experience, most of the labs limit patients from going into the laboratory. Um, so he chose, or this person, sorry, chose uh, technologists, uh, samples, and um, I'm sorry. So he, he, uh, they're explaining that they chose technologist samples and waste uh, will show the pathway on staff working in the lab, which is preferably is in one direction. Um, I think that techs go from one lab to the other, because if you're sharing samples, you're going to be going from one location to the next. So um, 
what the guides say is that you have to have a specific location for the patient to be, and that patient should not come into the lab. The techs know how to protect themselves, and if they move from lab A to lab B to lab C, they should you know, know how to doff the protective equipment if they're going to get out and then come back in into another lab. They know how to don and doff the, their pro, uh, personal pro protective equipment. So I think... I, 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 I think that the most important thing is patient uh, samples and, and waste. Okay, great. And then the last biohazard related one is, um, uh, are, are you allowed to use a biosafety level two when processing a TB sample? Uh, hmm, that's, a, that's an interesting question. You haven't concentrated the bug yet. Um, However, some people may have a, um, a high burden of um, TB and, uh, and that sputum may, be, may have a lot more bacilli than you think it will. So I think it would be best to do it in a, in a, in a three, just because it's, it's, it's better. I, it's, it's better for protecting the person. However, let me put it this way. I think a lot of our patients um, don't have that high bacillary count that will, that the, you, you need a, a, a level, a higher level if your count is gonna be higher. It's the same thing about the, the brucella. So if you're culturing brucella, it's, it's not the same as if you're handling just a specimen that could potentially have brucella. And because the brucella, the specimen that may have brucella, the counts of organisms are going to be relatively low. Once you concentrate at the brucella, then it can go in a lot of directions. So yes, we we worry about the entire flow, and I totally agree that the entire flow is important. But once you move the specimen from being a primary specimen into an area where you're going to concentrate the specimen. Um, because you're going to culture it, I think you need to use the, the protection that you need to use for that particular specimen type. I don't know if that answered the question. Great. All right. So the remaining three are more general safety questions. So maybe we can save them for the end. Okay, cool. So let's go to safety management. So um, it's very important to make sure that we have a safety management um, process, okay, that includes the, you know, having your material safety data sheets, that includes all the hoods, and includes everything that you need, your engineering, administrative, all the components of your plan. Because if you don't, and you have an accident, it, you, the, your staff will lose confidence. You, you obviously, the lab loses customers and reputation, and there's going to be increased costs, not only litigation, but basically you didn't provide the safety that needed to be there. So not having a plan for the entire thing on safety, and we've gone through the different kinds, can be very, very costly. So it's important to, to think about this and, ha and have a plan. So who is responsible for the, for the plan? It sh you should have a safety officer, or if there's one tech that you've assigned, and sometimes you do that. So let me tell you how we do it at Emory. So for the entire system, for the eight hospitals, we have two people that do safety. And they do our plans, they, they you know, schedule drills, they do all sorts of different things. They write all the, um, all the procedures and they visit us, the different sites on a regular basis. Actually, our, my two safety officers are here right now in my, in my, um, in my hospital. But for everyday things, we have in each one of our laboratories, so in pathology, we have a safety person. 
or one of the techs, one of the physician assistants is uh, pathology assistants is our safety rep there. And then in, in, in um, the core, we have a safety rep. And in blood bank, we have our safety rep. So each one of the labs has its own safety rep. And we give them time to go over safety procedures with our employees. So we not only have two safety officers, we have at the lab level, at the lab level, we have specific people that are in charge of safety and are, are helping everyone in the lab and they report to the safety officer. We have a safety manual with specific material that includes everything, the, the safety data, uh, the reagents used, everything. Then we have our standard operating procedures on safety. We train our personnel on all the potential risk and the safety procedures. And we obviously have the waste management. Uh, we have people that come and, and help us, uh, you know, take all the containers and all the stuff. Uh, we make sure that we have that. So we also have scheduled cleaning, you know, of the bench. Actually, our techs do the bench stops. They, they, as soon as they get here, they, the first thing they do is clean their bench tops and then start working. We do also have a uh, schedule um, environmental services to come and do our floors. And then we have our weekly instrument cleaning and, and maintenance, and then um, our weekly and uh, monthly um, cleaning of refrigerators, freezers, and storage areas. And uh, we, in every single bench, believe it or not, we have a little, um, a little um, record where people, you know, say, I did my, my cleaning today at X time and you initial it. So we, in every single bench and in every single refrigerator and all the areas, we have this um, schedule. Then, as I said, we do safety drills. Um, we do the drills for fire. We do the drills for, for spills. Obviously, we don't use formalin for our drills, but we, we tend to use um, um, substances that can be um, fluorescent in such a way that then we can see how well we did our cleaning. Um, obviously, we do uh, unannounced inspections. And this is interesting because this, um, this um, graph was uh, unannounced inspections regarding personnel and uh, protective equipment in the UCLA laboratories in 2012. They obviously inspected not only clinical labs, but they ins inspected all sorts of um, different um, labs. But it was really interesting because um, the, you can see how many labs fail, okay? And you can see what were the, 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 the violations. People were having food and drink in their labs. And it's, to me, that's incredible because that should not be um, happening. Then people are not using the, the correct PPE, including failure to work, to wear uh, closed shoes. So I think it's, it's, um, it's interesting that, um, even in 2012, um, in certain labs, mostly research labs, we still had uh, people having food and drink and not wearing the correct food work. So I hope um, that after um, today, we've um, gone through basically who's responsible. Um, we talked a lot about uh, safety manual, uh, the SOPs, uh, trained personnel, assessment of risk and laboratory design. And so the key message is neglecting laboratory safety is costly. It jeopardizes uh, lives and health of employees and patients and jeopardizes the laboratory reputation, equipment, and facilities. Okay, so this is part of our, um, of our 12 management um, items that we need to be thinking about. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Jeanette, that was great. Uh, we have uh, three more questions. Um, the first is related to risk assessment. So um, one of the panelists asked, how do you conduct a biosafety or biosecurity risk assessment and document the assessment in a systematic way? 
So you can use, uh, there's a bunch of checklists that, that you can um, use to define the risk of the, that, you can, that you can incur. So I think they're they're pretty much available um, online and in different um, places. And I think as you're doing your your compilation of your um, your MSDS, you'll see the different hassles and risks that you can incur, and then you can put them in a list and see you know are we doing the correct thing about disposal. Um, you know, are we doing the correct thing about how we're the personal protective equipment that they we're using when they're handling them? Are they in the correct? Uh, um, in, are they in the correct um, environment? So obviously, you try not to create your own. But if you have to create your own, it's not that difficult if you're basically taking your MS uh, DSS. And 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 listing the risks, and then um, and then making sure that you have the 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 things that need to help you to protect yourself. Great, thank you. Um, so then the next question um, has to do with um, monitoring your safety performance. So are there some indicators that uh, laboratories can use to monitor performance of their safety programs? So again, checklist. <laughs> so um, our so our our safety officers have created a uh, a checklist that they uh, that the that the, the the different laboratories have to um, comply upon. So actually, I have to sign it every month for every lab that okay, this month we did a fire drill. Next month, we did a, a, a spill drill. This month, we did this kind of training. That month, we did this other training. So we actually um, do this um, sort of uh, tiered in a monthly basis. We, we keep tabs of it on, on regularly. And, uh, and interestingly enough, it's, you know, it, it's interesting that you're asking the question because they pass to me to sign that they that I know what are the different safety things that they've they've done that month. Great, thank you. Um, all right, and the last question is about um, safety regulations around incineration. So, um, are are there any guidelines about incinerating? Um, it sounds like mainly. Uh, biopsies and biohazard uh, waste in the anatomic pathology laboratory? Yes, there are. Um, we, we, send, we don't do the incineration in the, in, in the premise. Uh, that we usually have contracted somebody to take our waste and do the incineration somewhere else, but their OSHA has very strict guidelines of what to do with um, with uh, with incineration. So it may be country dependent um, as to how you know how, what's allowed and what's not allowed uh, for incineration. So at least at Emory, we've we've done that. And actually, that's a great question because I, I don't know if people know, but. Um, some of the patients that, um, so when there was a big outbreak, the Ebola outbreak in, in, in 2014 in Sierra Leone um, and, um, <clears throat> and Liberia, and there were uh, United States citizens that were flown out of, um, of, um, of those countries and they were sick and um, brought back to the state. The facility that actually treated the most of these patients actually was Emory. And we did it in a, um, a specific um, unit that we have um, in, uh, at, at, at Emory. And, uh, and it was originally constructed because they were thinking about, um, about um, people at CDC, which CDC is basically across the road from us. So people being sent from CDC to different parts and they could be sick and then they could be brought home or left at home. And then since they already live in Atlanta because they 
you know, it's, it's across the street from Emory, that they would be um, housed and treated at Emory. So we've had this contract for over 20 years um, to treat these patients. We've, there's other facilities that have, um, that have uh, contracts like that. One is in Nebraska. And I don't, I can't remember. There's another one. Uh, one is an NIH. Those are the three facilities in the U.S. that that have that. But a lot of the patients that were brought um, from that outbreak were and had Ebola were brought to Emory. And actually, that was a, a huge struggle because our facility that does our um, our incineration of of all the waste from Emory. Uh, did not want to take the incineration of the Ebola patients. And so we had to do all sorts of permutations to be able to let us or, or let that facility do our incineration of, of, of material. Um, we had to decontaminate it first. And then after decontamination, we basically, they, they allow, they, they agreed to take that uh, those um, specimens and the different ways that were being created by treatment of these patients. So it's a big thing. It's it's a it's a really big thing. And um, and some facilities may go ahead and say there's no problem. We're heavily regulated by by OSHA, but this was it, this became a, a big, big thing when we had the Ebola patients um, in housed at, at Emory. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That, that's it for the questions. Um, did you have any other concluding remarks? Well, I have the case, so let's go quite oh, quickly. Oh, sorry, yes. So the case is called a fire in the lab. So here you have a photo of what was happening and you can see our smoke detector and you can see smoke coming out and actually immediately what happened as, as the smoke was coming out, uh, two of the techs in the lab um, localized where the smoke was coming from. They basically alerted everybody else that this was happening. You know, they just started, started growing, uh, uh, shouting fire, fire. Um, and then they localized the, the, the location where the smoke was coming from. From our safety officer, which was not the one localizing the fire, she uh, ran to the to code uh, code red. That's basically saying to the authorities, "We have a fire in the lab." And then the, the what the text did is they turned off the power source because the fire uh, where they realized the power was coming from was a UPS. Okay, so it's one of these big UPSs that uh, controls the voltage that goes into our chemistry instrument. So they turned off the UPS, they obviously turned off our instrument. Immediately after they had finished uh, turning off the, the fire, the fire squad came in to our core lab and uh, they, they saw that everything was okay. Interestingly enough, the smoke detector, even though it, it started um, detecting the smoke and, and the fire department knew that we were having a fire, it did not deploy the, 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 our fire, um, our fire um, detectors. Uh, once a certain amount of smoke is detected, start sprinkling water into the area. Fortunately, because we, if not, our, our whole lab would have been inundated by, by water. Fortunately, the level of smoke was not large enough. So the sprinklers did not start uh, sprinkling. If not, we would have basically had to close the lab. And so once the fire department came, the first thing that they did so that the sprinklers would not, since we had already contained the the, the area where the smoke was coming from, they immediately brought this things that you see, that blue thing. It's a, it's a HEPA, um, a, a HEPA um, filter to basically um, take all the, all the smoke out. Okay, so they took all the smoke out and then um, the, 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 we announced that we, the, code, the code red was cleared. Okay, here, this is the power source and it was in the back. It's, this instrument requires a uh, high voltage. 
So it, you can see that the plug is not even a regular plug. It's a very funny plug. Uh, but this is basically the instrument where the smoke was coming from. And the person that you see there, uh, Joy Williams, she's our safety rep for the cord lamp. So the question I have here is what is the most frequent source of fires in laboratories? This is a poll question. How are we doing, Ken? Um, let's see, sharing results now. Excellent. It is electrical. That is the most frequent, um, the most frequent um, fire in laboratories. Okay, so it's uh, the cause of ignition can be um, electrical equipment, or it can be in the electrical distribution system, but the uh, electrical, malfunctioning electrical equipment is the, is the highest, okay? There are two acronyms as associated with, uh, with a code red or a fire. Um, PAS, PAS relates to, and we should be able to get this one right in two seconds. How are we doing, Ken? Uh, only about 30%. So let's give them a oh, little bit wow. longer. <laughs> I think I've said it in the, in the lecture. Okay, we're up to 60%. So uh, here are the results. Exactly. It's um, using the fire extinguisher. Perfect. Okay, so remember, uh, race is for rescue, alarm, confine, and extinguish. So rescue is trying to figure out where the fire is coming from. From it basically gives you an idea of, of what to do. You rescue the people that are on the fire. You pull the alarm. You confine the fire, and you, if you can, you try to extinguish. But pass refers to basically the fire extinguisher itself. Okay, one of the things that we do, and I, I, when I talked about the spill, I talked about incident reports. So one of the things that we do is we do an incident report for any of these events. So in this particular instance, we had to fill out our incident report. So here the employee name, the person that, um, that filled it out was our, uh, our rep, our safety rep in the core lab was Joy. It was the lab, the department, the type of accident was a fire when it occurred. And what occurred, basically she said that there was smoke uh, coming out of one of our um, UPSs. And where, where did it occur in, in the core lab? Um, we, it wasn't a spill. And then we talked about the fire alarm, the sprinklers. And we talked about the the where our um, where our, our fire extinguishers. We talked about the code red. Um, then uh, what engineering um, place uh, was was in place at the time of the accident? Obviously, here is the the fire um, the fire alarm, the smoke detector and the sprinklers. As I said, fortunately, we didn't have the sprinklers sprinkling water everywhere because they would have ruined all the instruments. Um, uh, I guess they, they weren't at the point of, 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 of needing to function the sprinklers. However, the, the, the smoke alarm did work. Um, where engineering controls used by the injured uh, employee at the sign, they, we didn't need uh, engineering controls for that. They basically turned off the instrument. Um, so we didn't have the engineering controls, um, but that's, we're talking about the, the, the engineering controls is the, the, the smoke alarm and the sprinklers. We did not think that they needed to be replaced or repositioned. We think uh, they were effective in, in finding the smoke. Um, was PPE used? Well, they were using PPE as part of their work. Um, and uh, obviously for a fire, PPE is not 
what exactly you need. Um, but obviously we were using it correctly. And then um, did, did the people, did my techs uh, are there to work practice standards? Yes, they did. They, they tried to localize where the fire was and they turned off the UPS and they, um, we don't need to enhance any of, of that. They did the right things. Uh, I guess the only thing that I'm thinking would have been better is if we, our lab is very cramped and to get to the UPS is, is um, you have to be skinny and you have to go through a very, you have to go between the, the conveyor belt line that brings the specimens and the, and the equipment. And that space is very limited, but we don't have a space to expand. So I don't, there's no way we can do this in a better way, except if they move us to a, a larger uh, space. Um, and this is, we haven't had, this is the first time that we had the fire in the lab um, uh, here. Um, what action uh, will take to prevent the accident from occurring again? Well, hopefully the UPSs are working okay. I, we have two UPSs of that nature. One of the things that we did is if this um, UPS was having an issue, um, we need to look at the other, see if it's at end of life and decide whether we need to exchange it or not. I think that's an important thing because both, um, both uh, UPSs are basically um, on the same location. So we did have an engineer look at our other UPS and make sure that the, the other UPS was working okay. Um, and uh, one of the things that we also talked a lot about is since one of our instruments was going to be down until we replaced that UPS, we had to do a huge communication to um, our, our customers, which are basically all the physicians in the hospital. Um, we did, um, obviously, everybody reviewed the, the report, and um, we have a system where we enter all this incidents, and the system is called SAFE, um, and if it's a, a person, if, if somebody is injured, then that is not a, a, a worker, then we have to put it in, in the other system, which is called eVantage, so we, we did put this in SAFE. Um, and then I had to sign the incident report. So um, here you see one of the instruments, um, and that's the instrument that got um, that was that caught fire. Um, now, what I was telling you, I think one of the biggest problems that we had is since we we needed to continue to function, giving results in the lab. One of the things that we did is we did a big communication so that people knew that we only had one chemistry instrument and that when the maintenance was being done on that instrument that was working, that we would not be um, sending reports for between an hour or an hour and a half. So we did this um, communication. We, we have a tier communication system in our hospital. And the first tier is the core laboratory. The second tier is Every, all the laboratories, including you know, the core, blood bank, pathology, et cetera. And then the tier three, is this communication occurs daily. And we told the people to the entire hospital, nursing, administration, everybody, what was um, going on. And then, um, so in the medical huddles, we also informed the physicians. So we informed everybody and then we had a daily communication that occurred exactly at the time that we were gonna go down. Um, so because we were doing maintenance in the other um, instrument, we, we told them at this point we're down uh, chemistries. Um, and uh, the moment that we came up back um, to deliver results, we told them results are gonna be starting now. Um, we're, we're, we're up again. So the communication is due to an issue with a power supply in the lab. One chemistry analyzer that is used for CP comps, liver enzymes, and routine chemistries will be down for an unknown period of time. During this time, there will be delays of this test regularly until the issue is resolved. These delays, uh, you know, and when we're doing um, the maintenance, um, 
these delays would last up to one hour where we, we will be sending um, pages to the nurses and the ED and the leaders when we came come back up. So we had um, a message to the paging system when we were down and a message when we came up. And you can see the two messages here. So believe it or not, in the 12 years I've been at Emory, uh, this is the second fire that has happened in the lab, not in this lab, but in, in, in between the two labs that I work in. So the other lab occurred in the microbiology uh, department. And in this, um, lab, in this fire, what happened is the tech um, aimed the, the extinguisher to, and, and if you think about it, the incubators are tall and the plug is exactly behind them. Okay, so you have the plug behind them and you have the incubator. And so the, the, the tech saw the flames coming from the top part of the incubator. And, she, and he aimed the, 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 um, the, the extinguisher to the top part. Was this the correct thing to do? Or are we can? Uh, we're at about 35%. Oof. <laughs> Here the question, is the top of the incubator the base of the fire? I think that clarification helped because the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Responses are changing a little bit now. Okay, um, cool. I'm going to go ahead and share the results here. Okay, awesome. Exactly, it's incorrect. The base of the fire is the plug, okay? <laughs> so, and he couldn't see the plug. He couldn't see the flames in the plug because the incubator was, um, was shielding him from looking the flames. The only flames that he saw was what was coming above the, the incubator. He did what he could do, but he obviously did not aim at the base of the fire. And that was one of the things that um, our, our, our fire marshal, when we did the debrief and we, after we did the incident report of that particular, um, of that particular uh, fire, um, that's one of the things that we talked a lot about, the fact that when you're aiming your fire extinguisher, it has to be aimed at the base of the fire, at, at where the, the fire is starting. Okay, so here are a bunch of stamps uh, about fires and fire trucks and fire hydrants. Thank you very much. Unless there are questions about fires. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, interesting case. Uh, there aren't any further questions. So, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you, Ken, for helping with um, with the questions and uh, and the polling. Thank you very much. Yes, thank yes, you, thank everyone. you so much, Jeanette. <laughs> and we will see you on uh, Thursday for our next uh, session in this course covering equipment. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.